All right, let's talk about the war. Hagler Hearn's 1985 on the 35th anniversary. First and foremost, happy birthday to Hagler Hearns. Happy birthday slash anniversary to Hagler Hearns. One of the greatest fights that ever happened in middleweight in all boxing history. And as most fans would call it, the most, the greatest three rounds in boxing history. Respectfully, I disagree with that to a certain extent, but I'll explain why in a second. At the end of the day, it was a classic war one way or another. And it was like a cosmic clash between two of the pound for pound titans of the 80s and everything. Hagler is undisputed middleweight champion at this point. He's worked his way up. He's bounced back from going on and fighting Alan Minner and having that situation and being showered by a cascade of booze and flying beer bottles in Wembley over that fight and everything in the Vito and Affirmo situations. He had to battle his way up the rough way and what I always admired the most about Hagler was the fact that he had to do it he wasn't gifted with all the natural athletic gifts and talents of the other three members of the Fab Four. He just had a little bit and enough of everything. He was a hard collar, he was a blue collar worker in there. You know what I'm saying? Like Hagler would turn around. I still remember when he fought Benny Briscoe at 25 years old, fighting a 36 year old Briscoe, one of the Philly, one of the tough Philly Marlin fighters. And Hagler had to go through a lot of the tough Philly fighters early in this time. He had to go through a lot of them just to graduate and get himself up to that stage. His first two losses coming against Bobby Boogaloo Watts and Willie the Worm Monroe and stuff. He's fucked up Philly, ain't even got any type of commemoration for them, but that's another story. Fact is, Hagler gets in there and like, I mean, at this point, he's 10 defenses into his middleweight title, if I believe, and the only person that's even going the distance with him so far is Durant. And I think that that's an integral point in the story because when we look at the concept of pound for pound, notice that Hearns was a welterweight. Now, some people take that away from Hagler and they'll go, oh, well, he beat up a bunch of the little guys. Is there validity to that point? In a sense, yes, most of his biggest wins were Hearns, were Duran, who was a former lightweight, was Leonard, who was a former welterweight. However, the idea of pound for pound itself, I think is overrode when you're fighting great fighters. The idea of pound for pound itself is saying pound for pound, I'm the best at or around my weight division. Nobody here will beat me or knock me down from this throne. So every smaller champion is moving up trying to challenge one of those bigger champions to do that in the first place. On the other hand, the rest of the Fab Four, Leonard, Duran, and Hearns, all were multi-division champions. And that's one of the things that we applaud about them that made them the greats to begin with. So think about that distinction between what Hearns landed and what Hagler had. Had, Hagler had none. He didn't have the long, gargantuan reach of Hearns. You know what I mean? He didn't have the one-punch, deadly knockout power necessarily of a Hearns. He didn't have all of the footwork and the flashiness of a Leonard. He didn't have all of the, uh, I mean, he didn't have all of the, who are we talking, uh, Hearns, Leonard, Duran. He didn't have necessarily all the, fo all the ferociousness of a Duran. He had ferociousness, but he didn't have all the necessary tenacity of a Duran. But at the end result was, he sat there, reigned over his division, ended up being one of the floor, um, floor in the first place, ended up having one of the longest middleweight title reigns in history. And arguably, he knocks out uh, Hearns, beats Duran, controversially or so, and arguably could have beaten Leonard and everything, and ended up being a very integral mix of this part. So it's really, you know, a lot of times, like, we got to look at the overall composite and the overall skill set when it comes to a fighter. Hearns was an absolute sensation. He had already had his situation with Leonard, but it was no big secret what a destroyer he was. Everybody knew that since he knocked out Pepino Cuevas. I mean, we pretty much knocked him like Matrix style out. He moves up, goes to junior middleweight, he beats Benitez for a title, goes on to knock out uh, Duran. Naturally, they had a lot of common opponents in between. Both guys, I think, fought Michael Colbert. Both of them uh, fought different stages of his career and stuff, of course. Both of them fought Marcus Geraldo. And just to show that, like, the common opponents thing means nothing, Marcus Geraldo also gave Ray Leonard a very tough fight. And for this, Geraldo was no pushover. He was more like former California State middleweight champion. But meanwhile, Hearns blew right through him. Knocked him out in, like, the first round or second round. I can't remember. Long story short, going into this fight, what was crazy to me was I felt as though like Hagler asserted himself, coming off of knowing that he had already been able to go against a smaller guy in Duran and get the best of him in the exchanges, even though not by wide margins, but was able to wear him down to the body. I felt like him knowing that Hearns was coming to that third weight class and Hearns, weight cl and Hearns reach advantage, he knew that he had to be able to take that away from him right away. The first thing he did was look to meet him on the line and close that distance. If anyone remembers, as the fight started, Hearns comes out to the ring and kind of saunders, winders, and tries to like, start the line and walk him into a left hook, you know, drops his hands and starts to walk off. Hagler meets him with a shot immediately and everything and immediately looks to close that gap. 
and what I felt like at first turns to do was begin to punch a lot of times that he, before he had actually established his distance, before he'd set himself up, I felt like he was punching a little bit sooner than he was set. And like the thing about Tommy was a sniper and he was a killer and he was still able to land a lot of crazy shots even coming off the ropes and running into that line because he had that much experience, that much speed, that much power. But at the same time, his feet would get a little clumsy, his legs would get clumsy from time to time. Or his long legs going back in straight lines and Hearns would be able, a heckler would be able to meet him and catch him. Now what was crazy about it, you started to see some of the effect right around, like as soon as it happened. What was crazy about it was Emmanuel Stewart had said that before the fight, supposedly, Hearns had got a massage. And he actually was against this and he was upset about it in the first place. Because he said that like he felt as though that was gonna tense his legs up like before he got in the ring. He didn't want him to come in too cold and not be ready for that stuff. Who knows what effect that played. In addition, we know that in the second round, Hearns ends up breaking his hand and he's fighting like lefty. Or he's fighting like lefty for a bit and he breaks his right hand. And for all the fighters who sit there and make excuses about injuries, keep in mind, he broke his right hand in the middle of the biggest three rounds in boxing history, the biggest war whatsoever. And not only did he not bitch about it, not only did he not complain about it, he deliberately waited until the media left, until the press left, before he even reported this shit, because he didn't want Hagler's credit to be taken away from the victory. That's how a champion should act. Not, act, not talking about shoulder injuries and toe injuries and I had a flu and all this other type of stuff, and costume, whatever. Back to the story. I felt as though Hearns got in fight or flight mode. He had, if it was one thing I felt as though that he had in common with Miguel Cotto, with, with, and you know, shouts to him, he's a great fighter as well. But I felt as though every now and then when Hearns would get stung, I mean, there was no big secret that he would have chin issues from time to time, but when he would get stung, a lot of times it was like he got in fight or flight mode, and then the irony is that he would do some of the things he probably should have started the fight doing to begin with. And he would begin to like be able to use that distance of mind and a little better encounter and keep the guy wrapped up and controlled. And he would do it in spots when he needed to, but it's like he, he would have, always have to get in that emergency mode to have to do it to begin with. I think sometimes if there was one if there was one chink on him and everything, his temperament, he wanted to be a destroyer. And it like it and it would betray him at times in the ring, it would betray his height and his reach. Like he, he could use it with the best. He had the technical skills. He's a good gym graduate with the do it with the best, but at the same time and everything, and there were times that he would have been, there was a time at his will to get at the target and everything and kind of betray it and walk him in the punches. And you look at Leonard and everything, he was controlling him with the jab, and then, but he wanted to do some damage. He wanted to get close and he overshot a shot. And next thing you know, he walks into something and Leonard gets emboldened to stay in his ground with him and stuff. So I thought that that was like one of the big uh, downfalls he had right there was that he was forced to punch before he was fully ready. I felt like he kind of got caught cold, like coming right out of the fight. On top of that, I felt as though, you know, Hagler, I felt as though he fought an excellent fight as far as like dictating the pace and dictating the pressure from the outset, knowing that he had a better chance of putting Hearns on that back foot and a better chance of being able to walk in his wheelhouse. Now, while I say that I disagree when fans say that it was the greatest rounds, the greatest three rounds in boxing history, I think more of that is like really determined. I think more of that is judged by how the fight started. How it started in those first, in that first round, then how it proceeded in the next two. Hearns ends up breaking his hand. The second round and everything, he's really like trying to disengage a little bit. He's trying to counter and reset. I don't think that that was necessarily the most explosive round and one of the most explosive rounds in boxing history. It was a great round, but I think that gets overstated from time to time. Long story short, I thought it was an excellent fight. I thought both guys and everything deserve all their credit and they showed and you know, it had a, it had a lot of shaping and everything for this, the broader overview, how we, rec how we recognize the pound for pound scale today. I think the Dagla Hearns was a big part of it. Thank you.